Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Optimizing Quality Control Electric Records for 21 CFR Part 11 Compliance. I am Robert of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational seminar is presented by Labroots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. This webinar is also sponsored by Beckman Coulter. At Beckman Coulter, we are dedicated to advancing and optimizing the laboratory. For more than 80 years, we have been a trusted partner for laboratory professionals, helping to advance scientific research and patient care. We have a vital role. Our focus on innovation, reliability, and efficiency has led us to become the partner of choice for clinical research and industrial customers around the globe. For more information, please visit Beckman.com. Before we get started, there are a few instructions. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answers welcome, too. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll follow up with you if we don't have time today. Want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right or use the Q&A button, and we'll make sure to resolve any issues that you may have. I would now like to introduce today's presenter, Tony Harrison. Tony held the convenership of the ISO Working Group revising ISO 14698-1 and-2 microbial control and clean rooms is the UK subject matter expert to the ISO working group currently revising ISO 14644-1 and-2 for clean room clarification at the heart of the aseptic manufacturing chapters of both the European GMP and the USA C GMP documents. Tony holds a bachelor's degree in electrical and electronic engineering and is employed by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences as a senior marketing manager. Experienced in water system TOC conductivity and ozone analysis and clean room monitoring systems as well as particle clarification, Tony has spent the last 12 years in applied metrology for the pharmaceutical and healthcare manufacturing industries. Prior to that, he worked for companies providing process control automated solutions for manufacturing industries. Tony was joint editor in the ISPE Guide to Ozone Sanitation of Pharmaceutical Water Systems and was also chief editor of the PHSS Best Practices Guides for Clean Room Monitoring. Tony is a well-known international speaker and has provided educational seminars on TOC, liquid particle uh, counting, ozone sanitation for water systems, and clean room monitoring. With no further delay, I would like to now introduce Tony Harrison. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. My name is Tony Harrison. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, extremely critical quality control testing records that, of course, go out with every batch of product in the biopharmaceutical and pharmaceutical industry, particularly um, with a focus on the uh, uh, data integrity of those records uh, following the FDA's guidance on the uh, 21 CFR Part 11. So there's seven parts to the agenda today. It will last approximately 35, 40 minutes. Uh, the first section uh, is about the quality test records and what the FDA have to say about 21 CFR Part 11 for electronic records. And then I'll talk a little bit about manual standard operating procedures or SOPs that are still very much in use in the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industry. And then I'll talk about uh, electronic SOPs and how they can help improve the compliance to 21 CFR Part 11. 
And then talk about how these SOPs impact on the final product quality control, in particular for parenteral drug testing, and also for clean room routine environmental monitoring records. And item six on the agenda today is how to get electronic records from QC instrumentation, especially focusing on how some instruments have been optimized to make that process easier. And then finally, part seven, the conclusion. As Rob said, I'd welcome your comments and questions today. If I can't get to them all today, then I will come back to you after at a later stage. So let's look at the first section of today's presentation. Uh, quality control test records in electronic format, and particularly what the FDA have to say about them and 21 CFR Part 11. The FDA issued their own guidance to uh, interpreting 21 CFR Part 11, um, which is what we'll talk about today. In one of their parts of their guidance, the FDA talk about data integrity, and they give a definition of that, and they introduce an acronym, uh, ALCOA. So as far as the FDA's interpretation of, of what data integrity actually means, it means a, a complete record which is consistent and also has accurate data inside it. So their focus is really on making sure that the records that you're keeping, the electronic records, are in fact a true reflection of the test that was carried out. And I'm going to talk today about the steps um, between taking the test and getting the electronic record, which could actually introduce human error, which means you've got a very safe record, but which unfortunately doesn't contain accurate data. So the FDA go on to talk about the characteristics of uh, a complete and consistent accurate data. And it they say that it should be attributable, it should, of course, be legible so you can read it. It should be created contemporaneously, and it preferably it should be an original, or if not, a true copy, and of course it should be accurate, and this makes up the acronym ALCOA. Just for those of you who, like me, wondered what content contemporaneously meant, uh, uh, in this context, the, the, the dictionary definition is that the record should be made in the same time frame as the test itself. So what they're saying is that it's, it's best practice to actually generate the electronic record of the test data for quality control at the time that the test is done. And they're suggesting that uh, manual transcription of a test result from a paper-based record into an electronic record at a later time and date introduces the, the possibility of human error. Any manual transcription, of course, introduces that possibility. So, uh, touch on manual standard operating practices or standard operating procedures, the SOPs. Unfortunately, um, in our industry, in the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industry, the use of manual SOPs is, is, is still very rife. Um, and then typically paper-based, um, and the user typically has to manually configure the instrument carrying out the quality control test. And at the end of that, typically a, a paper record is produced, and uh, it relies on the operator manually transcribing that data uh, at a later time and date into an electronic format. Now, of course, this gives those touch points there for the uh, user to introduce the opportunities for human error to potentially impact on the integrity of the data and the accuracy of the data in that final electronic record. So if we just take a look as an example uh, for routine environmental monitoring in the clean room and look at the touch points where human error could be introduced. First of all, the particle counter doing the routine environmental monitoring has to be configured manually typically. So the number of samples that the counter takes at each location and the time or duration of those samples has to be manually configured. Typically, uh, as each location is reached and the particle counter is, is, is started. Uh, the sample location label, the name of the sample location, has to be manually entered into the particle counter, uh, typically done through a touch screen on the particle counter itself. And of course, this gives uh, the opportunity for manual, uh, for, sorry, for errors and misspellings. And if you think about it, there's typically thousands 
of data points taken for, for these particle counters uh, on the average pharmaceutical site. I was with one facility on the east coast of the USA, uh, and the, the manager there was telling me they had approximately 10,000 samples that they took on their site every month. So if you're manually typing the location name in and manually configuring the counter, it's a, a massive opportunity for uh, human error. And then, of course, the particle counting results, according to the, the GMPs, uh, we're required to report those results in counts per cubic meter. Um, so typically, the particle counter is set to run not, this is not a rule, but this is what I've observed. People run them for one minute or three minutes and average the results. But the particle counter doesn't take a cubic meter sample in a one minute run. It takes a much smaller sample. So you have to multiply the results reported from the count up to get the counts per cubic meter. And that sounds fairly straightforward, but it depends. If you have a mixture of particle counters on your site, then it's the opportunity for error does creep in, and I will explain a bit later on uh, a very real-life example of where I saw that. So, as I mentioned, if you have a variety of air particle counters on your site, then this can impact the, on the accuracy of the electronic record itself. Uh, one of the uh, parts of the acronym of ALCOA from the FDA's interpretation of the 21 CFR Part 11. In this slide here, you can see we have three particle counters. One of them is a small handheld particle counter. And then we've got a, an older version of a MET1 particle counter, the MET13315, which is now obsolete. Um, we have a newer version, the MET13445, which is a, a high flow counter. Uh, and if we look at those instruments and look at the, the different sample rates they sample at and the volumes they sample, and therefore the multiplier they need to get to counts per cubic meter is very different. So the small handheld one is actually only runs at 0.1 cubic feet per minute or 2.83 liters per minute, whereas the old obsolete MET13315 used to run at one cubic foot, so it's 10 times the, the flow rate of the small handheld. And the modern MET13445 there, that actually runs at, again at a higher flow rate, this time 3.53 cubic feet per minute and 100 liters per minute. And the reason it does flow at that speed is because it, it means that when you are classifying or requalifying, you can sample an entire cubic meter, which is a EU GMP requirement for grade A zones, and you can do that in just 10 minutes. Anyway, so if you run these counters for just one minute each, then you get a very different sample volume from each of these counters. So the small handheld will only count, obviously, sample at 0.1 of a cubic foot in a minute, whereas the old MET13315 would sample 10 times that amount, a whole cubic foot, whereas the high flow counter, the MET13445, will actually sample a whole 100 liters in that one minute. So when you're multiplying the results that the counter gives you up to get the uh, final counts per cubic meter, you can see the multiplication factor is very different for each of these counters. For the uh, small handheld, it's 353. For the old MET1, it's 35.3. And for the high flow counter, the MET1 3445, it's just a factor of 10. So you can see how if you've got a range of different particle counters on your site, you can see how operators can get confused and do the wrong multiplication. So if we look at those touch points again, the first thing the person has to get who's doing environmental monitoring or quality control, they have to make sure they've got the correct SOP. They need to make sure they read and understand the SOP. And if they're doing routine environmental monitoring, then they have to type each sample location in through the screen on the particle counter. They have to manually configure the particle counter for the sample time, the number of samples, whether it averages the samples or gives raw results. And they also have to make sure they're using the correct multiplier to result the, sorry, report those results in cubic meters. Finally, once you've done your environmental monitoring, you end up with a load of pieces of paper with all the results from that day's sampling on there. And somebody has to manually collate these, organize these printouts, and then manually transcribe them into an electronic format. And the last touch point is where the uh, review and approval step takes place where somebody has to check all these records to make sure they are accurate. 
Now this uh, does give a well-known problem for many sites. This is um, a, an FDA warning letter uh, which uh, was issued in 2012 and it's actually written up for a, a sterile manufacturer who's making sterile injectable drugs and uh, the FDA inspected their site and they went through their routine environmental monitoring data and they discovered that in their grade A or, or class 100 areas uh, and the, the surrounding areas, there were in fact 846 pieces of environmental monitoring data missing from the records over a two-year period. So somehow that data has got lost. It, maybe it was never recorded, maybe it wasn't transcribed into the electronic format. For whatever reason, there's gaps in the data. And of course, the FDA uh, wrote a warning letter for that site to highlight this issue needs to be remedied. So let's have a look how some instrumentation has been um, optimized to help us with face these challenges. Some instruments like the MET1 counter can actually have uh, the, electro the SOP in electronic format inside the instrument. So you can pre-configure all of the SOP, all of the sampling routine that you would do on a routine daily environmental monitoring into the particle counter itself. So you're no longer relying on a paper-based record for the SOP. It will replicate exactly what the manual SOP uh, tells you the operator to do. And when the operator selects that SOP from the uh, MET1, it will automatically configure the instrument correctly for each and every location according to what the SOP said. And the other thing is this counter will generate an, an electronic record straight from the instrument in the same time frame as the test. So this is what they mean by contemporaneously. So this literally will create the electronic record inside the counter and export it via wireless Ethernet as, as soon as the testing is finished. So this eliminates manual data transcription and of course reduces the uh, impact of human error. So this, these two things, the electronic S SOP and the uh, instantaneous um, creation of the electronic record improves the accuracy uh, of the record and of course it means that the record has been created contemporaneously which two key factors of, in the uh, FDA's interpretation of 21 CFR Part 11. So now if we compare that electronic SOP to the manual SOPs which we had previously, all the user has to do is select the pre-configured SOP from the, from the screen on the counter, the, the counter is configured, the electronic record is created and it goes straight to touch point two. So we've reduced three manual steps in there, or four manual steps, sorry, and we go straight to an electronic record which is now ready for uh, review and approval. So let's have a look at how um, manual SOPs can impact on final product testing. And today I'm going to focus particularly on parental uh, drug testing. Of course, the, uh, it's a very important step, the final QC of a parental drug. And the test requirements uh, vary from product to product. So if you have a, a small volume injectable, which is less than 25 milliliters, and there's a requirement to pull 10 ampules or vials together. Having pulled them together, you must have a minimum pool volume of at least 25 milliliters. And all the pharmacopoeias across the world are harmonized in saying that you should take four aliquots from that pooled volume of uh, a minimum of five milliliter each. So that's for small volume injectables. If you have large volume injectables, such as um, uh, IV drip bags, um, the sampling is uh, different, so it requires you to create your own sampling plan and you can sample less than 10 of these bags together uh, uh, when you're doing this test. And of course, on top of that, we have the new guidance uh, from the uh, United States Pharmacopeia, USP 787, which is focused on protein-based therapeutics. And in this particular case, although it's a small volume injectable, they allow you to take just a minimum sample of one vial or ampule, and it tells you that the sample, unlike the four times five aliquots that you need for the, sorry, four times five milliliter aliquots which you need for small injectables, it allows a minimum sample volume of four aliquots of 0.2 milliliters, so it's very different uh, to the small volume injectables. And the pass-fail requirements vary from product to product too. Uh, too. So for small volume injectables, it's uh, it actually you have to report the counts of particles per container. 
whereas for the large volume injectables, it actually counts per milliliter. And for the protein-based therapies, although the testing is different, the, count, the re results must be reported in counts per container again. So you can see it's quite a complex picture here. If you've got a factory which is making a range of different products, different parental products, different volumes, some of them will be freeze-dried or lyophilized and need to be reconstituted before they're tested. And quite often, the QC team talk about their products in terms of the brand name. They don't say it's a small volume injectable. They call it tersamine or repsamine or whatever the brand name is. And so, it, again, it can be quite confusing. Typically, the same facility may well be making a large range of, 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 of intravenous products, uh, drip bags and things like that. And again, they can be actually branded differently according to where they're sold around the world, depending on the historical basis. And so this whole thing gets very confusing when it comes to quality control testing. So I've touched on this already, but let's just go through the, the requirements for small volume injectables. Uh, as far as the United States pharmacopoeia, well, in fact, that all the pharmacopoeias are harmonized on this. And it says you must combine at least 10 vials. And they're trying to get a good statistical data from this. Having said you must combine the 10 vials, the minimum pooled combined volume from those 10 vials or ampules must be at least 25 milliliters. It does allow dilution. However, you'd have to take that factor, the dilution factor, into account when you're calculating the, the final pass-failed test. So you take your vials, you combine them together, take four samples. The pharmacopoeias tell us to discard the first one, which is trying to avoid carryover from the last batch you've tested. And then it suggests you should av average the next three. And each sample must be five milliliters or more. So let's apply that to a couple of fictional products. Now, these are made up products, and I apologize if anybody's using these for drug names. I just made them up. So we've got product A, which is called Repsamine. Uh, it's an ampule, and the, and the container size is five milliliters. And then we've got product B, which again I've made up. It's a fictional product called Tersamine, and it's in the same size ampule, five mil. But product A, when it's given to the patient, the dosage volume is just one milliliter, whereas product B, the tersamine, the dosage given to the patient is one and a half milliliter. Right, so let's apply these test results and show, sorry, these test methods and show just how confusing it can be for the QC technician. As I mentioned, all the pharmacopoeias are harmonized on this. So if we just focus on the small volume injectable test, which is appropriate for these two, pro these two fictional products, <coughs> And the pass-fail criteria is that these products should contain less than 6,000 particles at 10 microns of size or larger per container. Okay, so let's test product A, the Repsamine. As we said, the ampule, the container is five milliliter in size. So it tells us we must combine 10 ampules together. But when we do that, because there's only one mil in each a one milliliter in each ampule, you only get a pooled volume of 10 milliliters. So that's not enough. So in fact, you have to combine 25 ampules to get the minimum pooled volume required of 25 milliliters. So already we've got a variance there between what you might call standard practice. So say we, were, we run this fictional test and the results of the test tell us that you've got four and a half thousand particles at 10 microns or larger per milliliter in those vials. Now, is that a pass or a fail? So let's go back to our, our pass-fail criteria. It tells us we are allowed a maximum of 6,000 of those particles at 10 micron or larger per container. So we've got 4,500, 10 micron per, or, or per mil in those containers. We're allowed 6,000. So the container we're using here is a five mil container. So if you take that five and multiply the four and a half thousand, you end up with 22 and a half thousand counts per container, which of course would be a fail. But is it? In fact, as I said, we're allowed 6,000 counts per container, and the dosage inside that ampule is just one milliliter. So in fact, it's not the size of the container that counts, it's the amount of the product inside the ampule. So in fact, it's four and a half thousand counts times one milliliter, which means four and a half thousand counts per container. So in fact, it's a pass, not a fail. So that's Repsamine. That all seems very straightforward, not too complicated. But now we've got our second product, Tersamine. 
Now this one, the patient dosage is 1.5 milliliter. Now if we do the same thing here, we combine the 10 ampules together, because there's more in each ampule, you actually get 15 milliliters. It's not enough for the 25, so in this case, you actually have to combine 17 ampules to get, get to that minimum 25 milliliter pooled volume. So instead of it being 25 for the uh, repsamine, it's 17 for the tersamine. So you've got variability in there. Now say you run this fictional test and you get 4,500 counts, which are 10 micron or larger, we're allowed 6,000. Now is that a pass or fail per container? Now we're allowed 6,000 maximum per container. Now in this case, the dosage size is one and a half milliliter. So you have to multiply that four and a half thousand times one and a half milliliter, and the result is 6,750 counts per container. So that's a fail. So um, a test which produces the same number of counts per milliliter can pass with one product and fail with another. So it's all very complicated. So as I say, product A, same number of counts per container, repsamine, it passes. Product B, the container is the same size, but in fact it fails because the actual patient dosage is higher. So what we've done with some products like the Beckman Call to Hayek Farm Spec is we've optimized them to try and reduce this confusing uh, set of affairs. So we've improved it and reduced the human error, which helps with the accuracy of the testing. So what we've done is we've put the pre-programmed electronic SOPs, or we've allowed you, sorry, to pre-program your SOP into the counter itself. And the test selection can be done by a list of your own brand names. So you, as you can see in the example here, I put my fictional uh, drugs in there, Repsamine and Tersamine. So the QC technician doesn't need to think too much about the test. They select the product according to the brand name, and then they put through the test, and the machine itself will actually automatically uh, calculate the pass-fail and give a report in electronic format contemporaneously. So we've improved the accuracy, reduced human error, and got a contemporaneous result. The other thing that we've done with this is, is again, looking at the compliance with 21 CFR Part 11, is we put the, allowed the user interface for the actual particle count to be on a local PC close to the, count, the instrument itself, whereas the actual database of electronic records for this particular test can be stored on a remote secure server, which allows the site IT team to apply the 21 CFR Part 11 security to that remote server. This removes all manual data transcription, and the records are created instantly, which improves the 21 CFR Part 11 compliance for accuracy and contemporaneous results. So let's just take, go back to clean room environmental monitoring here. We've talked about the common issues about this, uh, and sometimes another issue I've been told by uh, uh, particle counter users is, of course, that sometimes the production team are running a little behind, and they need to get the production finished, and they don't want the technician to come into the clean room and carry out the environmental monitoring. So they ask for the technician to, to wait. So sometimes the technician can forget to go back and do that sample in that location there. Here's a real example where um, I found somebody not applying the correct multiplier um, to their particle counting data. In this particular case, uh, the, the SOP told the technician to take three times one minute samples at each location to average the results and then to record the counts in the daily environmental monitoring report sheet. Now, the reason this particular technician contacted me is because they were concerned that the results they were seeing in their uh, daily record record sheet were close to the maximum class limit at 0.5 microns for EU GMP grade A clean room. And in EU GMP, you're allowed a maximum of 3,520 counts at 0.5 microns or larger per cubic meter. So they were getting close to that limit and they were very concerned. Uh, and so you can see here, this is their, their daily record of their uh, particle counting, and they're getting very dangerously close to that uh, 3,520 limit. Now, what I found when I spoke to them was they were actually using an older counter, which had samples at just one cubic foot, or 2.83 liters per minute. And what they were doing is they're taking those three one-minute samples, 
and they were averaging the results. But what they were not doing was applying the multiplier. So they were reporting counts per cubic foot instead of counts per cubic meter. And of course, they should have been multiplying those counts per cubic foot by 35.3. So in fact, the counts they were recording were way below what, what they were actually should have been recording. And in fact, if they applied the multiplier, they were already out of compliance. And they'd been working this way for six months. Very dangerous. So you can see how complicated it can all be. And that's why we've allowed you to put the electronic SOP straight into the particle counter, which means you, you get to select the SOP from the particle counter screen. It does all the configuration automatically and contemporaneously generates an accurate electronic record straight to your remote server via wireless Ethernet. So let's just touch on how you get those electronic records out of the QC instrumentation. As I mentioned, many QC uh, particle counters, particularly portable instruments and things like that, still produce a, a piece of paper of uh, records. Of course, collecting all those or collating all those pieces of paper is time consuming for one thing, but of course it's, it's a ripe opportunity for human error to lose the pieces of paper or to forget which piece of paper was done for each location, or when you manually transcribe that data into the laboratory information management system or secure database again, it's another opportunity for human error to creep in. Now, what the FDA uh, guide us to, to the correct sort of electronic record, they suggest that you keep your electronic records in a format which is easily read. So what they're suggesting is you want to keep these records secure and safe, but at the same time, you want to be able to read them in 10 years' time if you need to pull them out of the server and look at them. So it suggests they should be in format, which is readily um, available and can be read on many different platforms, whether it's an Apple computer or uh, a Windows computer or even a smartphone. And they suggest you use PDF, XML, or SG, SGML, which are typical formats which are read on many different platforms. So the um, instruments that are optimized for pharmaceutical uh, QC can export these electronic records contemporaneously direct from the instrument, either via wired Ethernet or via wireless Ethernet, particularly for the portable instruments, or in some cases via a remote secure database. So for your wireless um, Ethernet, it's perfect for the routine environmental monitoring. So here the um, a uh, clean room technician is carrying the portable particle cap around, carrying out the uh, uh, the environmental monitoring using the electronic SOP pre-programmed in the counter, and they're exporting the data via wireless Ethernet straight to a secure server somewhere on the network, which allows the IT team on that site to apply the, the correct security controls for 21 CFR Part 11 compliance. In this particular case here, we're looking at a HIAC instrument for the QC laboratory. So this machine is doing the final testing for, for parental drugs. And in this particular case, uh, it actually uh, allows you to put the database of records on that remote secure server. So there's no records kept on the, uh, the local PC. In fact, every time each test is completed automatically and contemporaneously, it exports the results in electronic format complete with a pass-fail uh, calculation to that secure server, which again allows the IT team to control the 21 CF part, CFR Part 11 security for that server. So I'm coming to the end of my talk now. I'm at the conclusion. We've talked about how the FDA is giving us guidance. They're, they're welcoming the idea that we would go to electronic records for our, for our quality control data because they think it's a good way to go, but they are warning us that um, there's a possibility of getting human error as we transcribe those, those, those paper-based results into the electronic format. And uh, as I mentioned, they use the acronym ALCOA, which suggests that the electronic record must be attributable must be legible, must be created contemporaneously at the same time as the test, preferably an original and, of course, accurate. And we've talked about how manual SOPs make this a real challenge for us because of the manual instrument configuration and the paper-based records that they generate. It seems to go at odds with the FDA guidance. 
Quality control instrumentation is typically a capital investment, so you're buying equipment which you'll keep for maybe 15 or 20 years. In some cases, I've seen instruments older than that. So when you're purchasing your quality control instrumentation, even if you're not using electronic records right now, you should consider um, uh, investment in an instrument which actually has the opportunity to program those SOPs into the instrument itself, reducing all that human error. And it's preferable having an, an instrument which will generate a contemp contemporaneous record straight from the instrument via wired or wireless Ethernet. Even if you're not doing electronic records right now, it's a good investment for the future. And that completes my uh, talk today. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you found it interesting and useful. Uh, and now I am going to take questions. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Um, before we get started with all of your questions, here's a quick reminder about um, how to reach us today. If you'd like to submit any questions at this time, you may do so by selecting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. The first question today, if the Beckman HIAC 9703 is a record database on the remote server, the remote secure server, um, I'm sorry, is a record database on the remote secure server a mirror database? No, actually it's not a mirror. I understand the question. What you're saying is are we creating a mirror of the database kept on the HIAC 9703? No, it's actually only one database. It can either be located on the, uh, the user interface to the uh, instrument itself, or it can be, as I said, located separately on a remote server. And the, the attraction of that is that the instrument does the test, exports the electronic record instantly, and it means it goes to this remote server where the IT team on the site can implement their 21 CFR Part 11 controls. Thank you. In your experience, how well received are the electric SOPs with regulatory inspectors such as the FDA? Yeah, so electronic records generally are very well received by the FDA. Anything that can automate testing and reduce human interventions is, is typically very well received by, by regulators across the world. Thank you. In the FDA's acronym ALCOA, please explain what contemporaneously means. Yeah, contemporaneously is a, is a good one. Um, in the context of quality control records, what they're saying is contemporaneously means that the record should be created directly after the completion of the test. So, uh, for example, the electronic record created uh, from the electronic SOP inside the Beckman Call to Met 13400 air particle counters can be created and transmitted in instantly after the test. Thank you. Does the 25 milliliter minimum volume apply to the overall sample container size or dosage size? I didn't understand why you wouldn't just take the 10 ampules of product A from the 50 milliliter total volume. I'm not sure as I fully understand that one, but um, what I was saying was the rule book tells us we must take a minimum of 10 vials or ampules. Now, if you've got sufficient volume in each of those ampules to make up 25 milliliters, which is the required cooled volume you must take, um, then um, that's fine. You just need 10 ampules or vials. But if you if you haven't, as in the examples I showed, where the, the product A had only one milliliter in the vial or ampule, so if you only take 10, which is the minimum requirement, you only get 10 milliliters, hence why you would have to take 25 if you only had one milliliter inside each ampule. I, I hope I've answered that correctly. I wasn't sure about the question, but I hope I've answered it correctly. Thank you. And what can you do with um, old instruments that don't have a direct electronic records uh, generation of capability other than replacing the instrument altogether? Yeah, unfortunately, that, that is the, uh, the only way forward. So if you've got an, an older instrument which, which just gives you a paper printout, 
um, generally speaking, there's, there's not much you can do with it. Um, I have uh, recently, well, just this year, in fact, I've visited several production facilities where because of the, um, uh, the resistance to change, which, you know, we, we all try to not to change things in the pharmaceutical or biopharmaceutical quality control world, the instruments, we don't tend to change them because, of course, that means revalidation, uh, which is timely and costly. But um, I've seen sites uh, just this year which were using particle counters that were made obsolete 20 years ago, uh, and they're desperately hanging on to them because they don't want to change them. But unfortunately, because they are so old and they're producing just a paper printout, the actual um, uh, computing engine, if you like, inside those particle counters is not capable of generating an electronic record. It's just not powerful enough. So um, there's nothing much you can do with them, I'm afraid, unfortunately, other than buy the next generation from your supplier, who, which hopefully would allow you to put the electronic SOPs in there and generate the electronic records. Thank you. For the next question, can this software, FarmSpec, manage Levy Jennings charts? I apologize. Can you repeat that for me, please? Oh, yeah. I'm terrible. Sorry. Can this software, FarmSpec, manage Levy Jenning charts? Ah, right. Okay. No, it, it can't. It just literally produces the test results from the, uh, the test in electronic format. It does say pass-fail, but it, unfortunately, no, it can't do that. Thank you. And what protections against unauthorized changes do you have in place for the electronic SOPs in the instruments? Sure. So, the, um, for instance, in the MET-1, the air particle counter, the portable air particle counter, we, we've applied multi-level user um, controls. So, you have an administrator, manager, and user. So, only the administrator or the manager can actually make changes to these electronic SOPs. And typically, where, when the user logs on, uh, they have a very limited menu available on the screen, which is literally to, uh, to choose the SOP they're going to use that day uh, and then to run the counter. There's nothing else they can do or change on the counter. So we've locked it down. So once you've uh, pre-programmed them, uh, it locks down as far as the user is concerned, and all they can do is, uh, is to, to run the counter. So that's how we control it. Thank you very much. Um, one of our viewers um, is attending from a food and safety instrument developer and is wondering whether um, they need to follow 21 part 11. Yeah, so the, um, the, 21, CF, the, the, the 21 CFR part 11 is, uh, um, applies to um, food and drugs. So like the FDA, of course, is the Food and Drug Administration, it applies to food and drugs. So it's, it's really anybody who's trying to uh, keep um, quality control records um, uh, in electronic format should try to apply uh, 21 CFR Part 11, whether it's food manufacturing or whether it's pharmaceutical or biopharmaceutical. Well, thank you so very much. Um, our last question here that we have is, most injectables um, have some overages in volume um, fill to allow for bubble casting. What calculating the pass-fail do you use, actual injections, or the physical volume inside the vial? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, what you're saying is the actual uh, the volume of the, the solution inside the vial or the ampule is actually slightly more uh, than you would give to the patient because, of course, typically the, uh, the nurse or the doctor would actually want to eject a little bit of the sample to remove bubbles from the syringe before they inject it into the, the patient. So my interpretation of that would be um, potentially you could inject the entire volume inside the vial into the patient depending on who's giving the injection. So potentially that entire vial could be given to the patient at one go. So I would interpret it that you should do the calculations regarding the pass-fail uh, 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 and take into account the total volume that's actually in that vial or ampule. So if you've allowed an extra small amount extra over and above the dosage that you're going to give to the patient, you need to calculate it with the total volume because it could be possible that somebody 
won't eject the bubbles, they'll just give the whole thing to the patient. So that's the potential um, uh, outcome there. So you should test the entire volume inside the vial, and that's how you base your, your pass fail results. Right. Right, and thank you so very much. Um, do you have any final closing remarks? Um, just to say thank you to everybody um, for, for attending today. I hope it was clear uh, and I hope I've explained how electronic SOPs and contemporaneously generated electronic records from the instruments can help remove a lot of those uh, opportunities for human error in uh, final product quality control. So thanks again for attending. Well, thank you very much. I would like to thank um, Mr. Tony Harrison today, as well as our sponsor, um, Beckman Coulter for making it possible to bring this presentation to you. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 8th, and you will receive an email from us alerting you when it's available on demand. Post it on labreach.com. You're welcome to forward this announcement to any of your colleagues who are not able to join us today. Well, I want to thank you again, and see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you, Rob. Goodbye. <laughs>